It's time to turn to the Word of God. And let's open uh, a passage from the Sermon on the Mount in, recorded in chap Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to, see you and take, uh, to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain to, on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And as we open our hearts at this time, please touch us with your love and your grace. Teach us to love how you loved us. And help us to be amazed about your love towards us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is outlining the principles of kingdom living. He has invited us to live in his kingdom already now as his children. And he gives us the principles how we should relate to each other. You know, we all know that love seems to be in short supply in this world, especially now. War in Ukraine, in Israel, almost daily shootings on our streets, strife in families. It seems that hate is ruling the day. How do we love? in this unloving world. And in, here in this scripture, Jesus is outlining some principles and addressing this issue, how, as his children, we should be loving each other in this world. Let's try to unpack this passage. Well, first of all, we, we can notice that Jesus is using a, a, a formula, a certain formula here that is common throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount. He starts with a statement, you have heard that it was said. And what does he refer to? The Old Testament, the Torah. You have heard that it was said in the Old Testament, and then he follows up with his own statement, but I tell you, and then he gives a radically higher code of ethics to follow. So, what is he referring to? The function of the Old Testament law was to regulate retributive justice, to ensure that the punishment for an offense is commensurable to the offense. One eye for one eye, one tooth for one tooth, to make sure that, that you know, we don't pluck out two eyes if one eye is were lost. Or that you don't kill the person if he kicks out your tooth. 
justice. But does it sound quite right? <laughs> Not really. That was getting even. That was, you know, this proportional justice. But we need to realize that God was calling out his people at that time from a culture that was very savage. And we can't say that today the culture is not savage in this world. But, but that was dog-eat-dog -dog world. And, and if you crossed me, I would cross you ten times more. So God was calling his people out into a proportional justice. But now Jesus says, you have heard that advice in the past. But I tell you that this code of ethics is not good enough for, for my kingdom. You have to follow much higher code of ethics. That settling your debts and, and getting even ethics doesn't work in my kingdom. So the position that Jesus proposes is shockingly radical. Not getting even. No retaliation. No revenge at all. However, we need to understand that the purpose of Jesus here is not to impose a new social or economic order or system, but instead to establish a new understanding how, as his children, we should relate to each other. He challenges us to go all out in loving each other. So he uses three analogies or three little examples at the beginning of the text that we read. First, in verse 39, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Hmm. What, what is he trying to say? We need to understand some things in order to understand what Jesus is really trying to say. Uh, most people are right-handed, right? Is that fair to say? Most people are right-handed. So if you want to slap somebody who is standing in front of you on the right cheek, what you need to do? You have to do it with the back of your hand. And you know what it means? It means an insult. So Jesus is not talking about physical attack, even though slap is a physical attack too, but he's talking about an insult. In our relationships, sometimes we hurt each other and sometimes we insult each other. So that gives a little bit more context to this teaching of Jesus. Now, the, in next verse, he moves on to the next example. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Well, a shirt was a typical collateral for a debt. If somebody, if you wanted to borrow money, they would ask for a collateral. You take off your sh shirt and give it to me until you pay it back. But the coat was far more valuable than a shirt, understandably. Why? Because it was used as a sleeping bag at night. So, according to Exodus 22, 26, nobody was allowed to take away the coat. And if they did, they had to return it by the end of the day so that the person could have a place to sleep in. Jesus is suggesting here that we offer the coat freely, voluntarily. And the third one, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go within two miles. What is that? Well, there was a rule instituted by the Romans. Roman soldiers had a right to enlist anyone they wanted for forced labor as porters to carry their, their gear. But there was a limit that they can force you to carry it only for one mile. There is an example in the Bible 
at the crucifixion time, the Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry the cross of Jesus. That's exactly the same thing that, that we are talking about here. So there was a limit for one mile only. And Jesus is calling his followers to volunteer, volunteering double the, the distance. Well, for the Jewish listeners, these were pretty outrageous things to hear. Jesus is saying, in your relationships, go beyond what is required and what is expected. Go all out. Don't calculate. Don't hold anything back. But wait a moment, we may ask. Doesn't it mean that we kind of endorse the wrong behavior? If we do that, what Jesus is saying? Doesn't it mean that we sometimes enable abusive relationship, or abusive behavior? Well, the thing is, and this is very important and we need to understand while we are talking about this call of Jesus to this extraordinary love. Well, Jesus is calling us to love without reservations. He does not ask us to become doormats and to allow everyone to walk over us. He doesn't want us to become enablers of abuse nor to ignore injustice. Let's think about one more time about the other cheek. Some people believe that what Jesus is saying is don't resist. If somebody hurts you, don't resist. Somebody mistreats you, just let him do it. If another attacks you, don't protect yourself. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. It can't be so. You know, if we, if we remember Jesus is talking so much about justice for the marginalized, for the poor, for the oppressed, how can there be justice if we ignore injustice? And second, this kind of understanding of this text is inconsistent with the examples that we see in the Bible. For example, in the middle of his trial, Jesus himself protested the illegality and injustice of someone striking him. He protested. Paul did the same and he was jailed without a trial, a Roman citizen. He protested. He, he called for justice. He went to court. He appealed to Caesar. You see, they did stand up for justice, but they did it without rancor, without vindictiveness, without vengefulness. So what does Jesus then mean by turning the other cheek? I believe it means to bring in a balance. A balance between justice and love. And we have a marvelous text that we all love in Micah 6, 8. Right? What does it say? What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Justice and kindness go hand in hand. You see, our sinful human nature tends to go in one of the two ways in response to an insult. One is to let them keep slapping us and we just don't object. Let them slap, let them slap. I'll just be patient. And the other is, as bad, is to slap back. You slap me, you get the slap back right away. 
It's natural response, one or the other, but none of them is healthy. And sometimes we do both. <laughs> you know, on the outside, we may be so passive, ignore the abuse, but inside, we are raging in hatred. And that's not where Jesus wants us to be. Jesus wants us just the opposite. He wants us to, on the outside to stand for justice, but internally to have peace and tranquility and forgiveness in our hearts. Let me illustrate it, how it works in, in, in real life. A woman was talking with her verbally abusive father on the phone. So they were talking for a while and suddenly she is quiet for a moment. And then she says, Dad, I want you to know that I cannot allow you to talk to me like that. I won't put, I won't put up with that and therefore I'm going to hang up now. I care for you, I love you, and I want to have a good relationship with you. I'm willing to try again, but I am not going to listen to this. So she hangs up. What did she do? You see, she, naturally, she could have simply listened and sat there and listened and listened and said nothing. Oh, this is my father. I just have to put up with that. Or she could have slapped back and said, Dad, you said what? I've had it with you, blankety blank. <laughs> I don't want to ever see you again. These are natural ways of responding of our hearts. But this woman, what did she do? She turned the other cheek. She put the relationship on another footing. She turned things around so that there could be justice and kindness together. Do justice, love kindness. Not one or the other, but both. So, having established that, how do we respond to the call of Jesus to such a radical love? You know, yes, Lord. I do love them. I do them. I do love most of them, but not this person. <laughs> you know, this one who is so annoying, constantly gossips about me behind my back, constantly takes from me and never gives me anything. Lord, I love them, but not this person. Anybody but him. You know, there was a, a man who was pouring concrete in his driveway and he worked hard all day and was trying to make it smooth and shiny and, and, and once he was almost finished and was kind of straightening up and, 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 you know, was looking at his job well done, he noticed there was a neighbor's kid was running across the front yards and he jumped over his, uh, his hedge and took a beeline through that new, uh, new concrete. This man couldn't stand it. He exploded. What did you do? You! His wife inside the house overheard his outburst and reminded him, George, remember, we have to love our neighbors. Yes, I love them in principle, but not in concrete. <laughs> I do love people, Lord. 
I'm very happy to share with them. But this person, you want me to love him, but he really hurt me. He's an evil person. I can't love him. She doesn't deserve my love. And Jesus says, stop. Hear what I'm saying. In verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? If you love only when the love is reciprocated, it's not good enough. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not, do not even pagans do that. Wow. How is that possible? To love without reciprocity. To love someone who keeps hating you. Who keeps getting under your skin who keeps annoying you. But that is exactly what Jesus is calling us to do. Could it work in marriage? It's hard. You know, most of the time, we are used to transactional relationships. You know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Or 50-50, right? Let's meet in the middle. I'll do as much as you do. That's a transactional relationship. Which means that I constantly gauge your performance and then adjust and measure my response accordingly. But then the love that is shared is measured, dispensed in little portions according to your behavior transactional relationship but God is calling us to a covenantal love covenantal relationship I made a promise and I will keep it no matter what you know Trish was telling me that Peter her husband has been truly living up to the vows that he gave her at the wedding in sickness and health. That's the kind of relationship that Jesus is talking about. But just imagine if both spouses would go for all, going all out with their love and, and, and care and not measure or dispense their love according to the performance. You know, the closest illustration of this kind of love that comes naturally in human experience is a, is a mother's love for her baby. And by the way, yesterday I got another granddaughter, so <laughs> very sweet. What is the relationship like between a mother and a baby? You know, it's also give and take. The mother is the one who gives all the time, and the baby is the one who takes all the time, right? Feeding, changing diapers, feeding again, changing diapers again, and then maybe in the middle of the night trying to get your baby to sleep. And what do you get back? Nothing. Well, stinky diapers. <laughs> uh, maybe some milk on your dress that the baby burps out after feeding. And maybe, just maybe, an occasional smile that makes it all worth it. <laughs> you see, this is a one-way love. And when God was looking for a way to demonstrate or to illustrate his love for us, you know, he used this example. A mother, can a mother forget her baby at her breast? It's impossible. But even if it happens, and sometimes it does happen, 
God says, I will not forget you. This is how I love you. There is a, a children's story that is beautifully, beautifully written, and the author is Shal Silverstein, and you probably are familiar with that, and I want to share it with you here. The Giving Tree. Just remember that every parable, and this is a parable, has limitations. There is one point that it makes, and let's not try to read into it something else that is not there. But let's enjoy it. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come and climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat her apples. And the boy loved the tree very much, and the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older, and the tree was often alone. Then one day the boy came to the tree and the tree said, Come boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I'm too big to climb, said the boy. I want to buy things. I need some money. Can you give me money? I'm sorry, said the tree. I have no money. But take my apples and sell them. Then you will have money and you will be happy. And so the boy gathered her apples and carried them away, and the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a very long time, and the tree was sad. And the one day he came back, and the tree shook with joy and said, Come, boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I'm too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a wife and children. And so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. But you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, The tree was so happy, she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered, come and play. I'm too old to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. And said, so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy. But not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I'm sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give. My apples, my branches, and my trunk are all gone. I wish I could give you something that have nothing left and just an old stump. I don't need very much, said the boy just a quiet place to sit and rest. Well, said the tree, an old stump is good for sitting. Come, boy, sit down and rest. And the boy did. And the tree was happy. In this parable, when the tree freely surrenders its fruit, its branches, and her trunk. We are reminded about Jesus, of whom Paul wrote to Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself. He cried out his heart. He stretched out his hands to be nailed to the tree. He poured out his blood. How far can one go to show his love for another? Yet he did it all to pay the debt of our sin and to help us believe that he loves us. 
Paul wrote to Romans chapter 5, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. While we were far away and enemies of God, there was no reciprocity. God loved us to such a degree that he gave everything. He emptied himself. What kind of person does that? For his enemies, emptying himself, giving away everything, going all out. Who can love like that? He kept loving and loving and loving, loving us. If you want to be able to demonstrate the love that Jesus is calling us to, you have to focus on that one truth. The staggering, mind-blowing truth that God loves you unconditionally. Just the way you are, not as you should be, because none of us here is as we should be. You have to believe that God loves you, not the person sitting next to you, not the pastor, not the conference president, not anybody that you are looking up to, but you, with all your flaws, with all your rejection of him. He loves you to such a degree that he would rather die than be without you. I would like you to think about the single hardest person in your life to love. Who is the hardest person to love in your life, whether at your work or school or maybe in the family? Maybe that's a person who is constantly annoying you, maybe dishonest to you, insulting, maybe belittles you and denigrates you. Can you, will you show that person kindness, even though they may not deserve it? If you want to ever be able to love such a person as Jesus calls you to, you have to go to Calvary to behold the man and discover that he has gone all out to love you. And you have to do it every day to remind yourself about that unconditional, unbelievable love every day until that glorious day when the giving tree once again will stand in its majestic splendor and we'll all be climbing up its trunk and swinging in its branches and eat, it, eat its fruit forever and ever. Listen to the words of Paul as if you were hearing them for the first time in your life in Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's it, that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord.
Lord, thank you for loving us with all our flaws and faults. Teach us to be amazed by your grace and love. We need you. Like air to breathe. Like water to drink. Fill our hearts and our souls so that your love and your grace would shine through us in this dark and broken world. In your precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>